Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. Tashihan Miller here with this week's episode of Kuden. I apologize for being a little overdressed. I just had a tie on and a bunch of other things. Um, today we laid my mother-in-law to rest. So um, anyway, I'm just getting in and sliding in under the wire. So anyway, uh, just a quick, quick, quick admin kind of thing. Just to thank everybody for the well wishes and uh, the good juju and positive vibes and and whatnot. Um, I just I'm blown away by the outreach. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for, uh, to those of you who are consistently showing up, uh, almost every week or you're binge listening to the episodes, you know, I can't say that I wouldn't be doing it without you. Cause there's <laughs> lots of these episodes that were pre-recorded in the can, like anything below episode 68. Um, I was with, uh, my black, belt uh eric white but well, that sounds weird right black belt eric white anyway um he he was actually a well he ended up being a uh, station manager and a vp of programming and all kinds of stuff but i always called him my radio god because he was an on uh, on-air radio personality and so anything below episode 68 so 67 and below uh was eric and i getting together in a uh radio station uh, booth, right? And um, like on Saturdays and putting anywhere between one and three um, episodes in the can, so to speak, right? And then divvying them out uh, as we went along. And then uh, for those of you who know, and you've been around for a while, uh, I took about a year and a half off. Uh, Eric's life had changed. He shifted, moved, uh, I think, to the West Coast. And um, uh, things kind of shifted around and I needed to think about how I was going to, um, you know, work the format. And then, um, I just decided I was just going to do it because, you know, um, one of the things I find, and this, I, I, I was told this a lot by teachers, um, Hatsumi Sensei, uh, Shoshi Malmstrom, a bunch of folks, right. That, uh, there's one thing that warriors do, it's make decisions. And this has kind of come full circle because I have uh, other life mentors now that um, are saying the same thing. And one of the big differences that they make is one was one was general, right? Warriors make decisions, right? We're just action people and we make decisions. Um, and, you know, to handle the, well, what if I make the wrong decision? I'll make another decision. Right. Everybody's afraid of making the wrong decision because what we're still in school and we're going to get a, a letter grade for it or we're going to get a percentile or whatever. Right. Um, you just make another damn, damn decision. Right. Well, what if I have a dilemma or there's like three things or whatever and they're all equal? Well, then I can pick something. Right. I mean, you'll know within seconds, if not minutes or a day or two, whether or not um, whatever. But as soon as you start acting on something. We did a whole episode uh, previously on this with the, what was it? The, uh, not foundations of mindfulness. It was the, the hell was it, James? Um, I had my notes here, um, but either way. Um, so, um, but you'll start getting feedback. You'll start getting information and whatnot. And, and, you know, you can do these things anyway. All right. So, um, that aside, right. So, um, but still tied in with decisions and, um, so I'm going to lead off with uh, a quote that uh, there's, there are these memes, right? But how can you say quotes floating all over the internet and whatnot? And, um, you know, uh, if you want a good list of quotes, find a book called understand good play, right? If you weren't there for the classes, most of it's just going to seem like it's that it's quotes, right? But they're going to be out of context because you weren't in the class when they happen. So anyway, um, but one of these quotes is, the wrong brush on the battlefield is not one forgiven easily. All right. So we're going to talk about that and more and a bunch more about this decision making and how it ties in with training and kata and self-defense and yep. Right back to the battlefield. Okay. Uh, when we get back. All right. So talk to you in a minute. So the big question is this, how are self-defense and success minded people like us, Concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world. How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge, and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves? 
and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kuden Radio, real training for real people in a real world. All right, I'm back. James is lurking in the background there. Um, he'll pop up at some point, but every time he pops up, he takes over the screen. And at least I'm just going to make him do the whole episode. All right. I don't know how that's going to go, but anyway, <laughs> he's back in the background shaking his head. No. Anyway. All right. So um, before I jump back on uh, those quotes, I kind of left you hanging with something. Um, the the quote that I, I let off with, for those of you jumping in late, was uh, something that's me since they said a while back that, uh, the wrong brush on the battlefield is not one that's forgiven easily. Okay. Um, and this has to do with decision making, right? Not just can you make them, right? Um, but knowing which one, right? But the battlefield could be anywhere. And we'll we'll you know expand this out as we go, right? But it's a problem that needs to be solved. Now, battlefield, we get it, right? You make a mistake on the battlefield. Right. You pull the wrong. And it's not just the brush. Right. It's the decision. It's the tool. It's the tactic or whatever. Right. And while you may not pay the ultimate price. Right. Um, your companions may. Right. Your team might. Uh, innocence might. Right. Um, and I can speak something to that. Not, not about the mistakes, but uh, being in situations uh, like that. Right. Because uh, I can still see the other side of the transport aircraft. Um, now, for most of you, you well, some of you, you might even not even have been born yet, but um, in the mid 80s, I was flying down to this tiny Caribbean island called Grenada, which I want to go back now because, you know, it's a tourist place, right? Crystal clear waters and all that. But when I was there to, quote unquote, rescue medical students um, and to stop... Uh, a, a not so great group uh, from putting in an airstrip that would put them within spitting distance of the shores of uh, Florida. Um, I remember sitting there staring at the far wall, going through my training, not just this training, military training, all that kind of stuff. Right. And thinking about where the door was, how I was situated, you know, if the plane didn't get vaporized in the sky, if it didn't fall to pieces or get blown to pieces when we hit the landing strip, whatever, right? Um, when I cleared that door, right, what I was looking for and what my next move would be until I received orders or whatever, right? Um, and we're going to talk about having a head full of techniques, tactics, strategies, and all those kind of things, right? Because um, there's another quote that I have from Matsumi since they that speaks to a lot of the misunderstandings, I think, that goes on um, in martial arts, self-defense, uh, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, from, from a bunch of different angles, not, not just, you know, from students, right? Uh, people saying this, this won't work, that won't work, whatever, right? Um, but let me go back to something I, I was saying during the introduction that um, you know, this thing started with my teachers in this art, in Ninjutsu, right? And again, Hatsumi since they said it, uh, Shoshi Malmstrom said it, uh, a bunch of people, right? That warriors make decisions. And if you're ever worried about making the wrong decision, um, don't. Because as soon as you make a decision, you'll start getting feedback, right? Well, if you make a decision and you start acting on it, you'll start getting feedback, right? If you make a decision, but you don't do anything with it, well, that's not a decision, right? That was a passing thought, right? That was an idea, okay? Um, a decision is something to be acted upon, right? But if you act on it, you'll start to get feedback, right? So again, decisions. Well, here we are, right? I started in this martial art in 1980, okay? You do the math, right? And here I am, and now I have uh, life coaches in a different realm, business, and uh, I mean, we're talking like super achievement kind of stuff, right? Which ties in, all this stuff ties together. And um, one of them, points out <laughs> rather strongly, right, that there's a huge difference not only in how quickly top performers, whether they're athletes, celebrities, 
uh, business, whatever, right? It doesn't matter. Martial arts people, whatever, okay? There's, there's not only a difference between how quickly these folks make a decision and then, uh, and then act on it, but the sheer number of decisions and actions they make, okay? So here's a statistic. The average person may act on four decisions a month. That's the average, okay? So they make decisions, but procrastination, all that wonderful time, right? Uh, wonderful stuff, right? Can kind of get in the way. And so uh, four, okay? And what that means is they could make a decision on Monday, but take a week to act on it, okay? And this is, this is the average, right? Which means there's a lot of folks that make a decision and then on, you know, make a decision on Monday and then on Friday or Sunday, they make a decision as to when they're going to act on it. So they made another decision about the initial decision, but whatever, right? So anyway, but these high performers make a decision and act on it <laughs> um, three or 400 times more and faster, right? So even if we, even if we just go with 10, right? So the decision that was made on Monday is acted on on Monday, right? Put into motion. And if it's easily finished, then it's finished on Monday. If not, it'll, it'll be finished as quickly as possible. Right. And then another decision is made on Tuesday and acted on on Tuesday, another decision on Wednesday and acted on Wednesday. Right. Then there's other ones. Uh, there's one that I've been, um, uh, I haven't, I've, I've been following his lessons, but I'm not a direct, uh, mentee at this point. It's kind of an off on again, off again kind of thing. And, um, he splits his days in half and counts each half of a day as a day, right? Um, so the first part of Monday, right? So Monday morning, 6 a.m. to noon is his Monday, right? From 1 to 5 or 1 to 6 is his Tuesday. Okay? And in all honesty, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around it. I think he does the same thing after dinner. Uh, now, that may be family time or whatever, but he compacts two to three days into each single day. Okay. So interesting, right? What the hell does that have to do with us? Anybody here ever been on a battlefield? Anybody here ever been? Uh, well, I know I got lots of law enforcement and security guys, so you know, right? Back alley, duty shift, whatever, right? Um, you're making a boatload of decisions and acting on those decisions in the moment multiple times a day, right? A boring day is a good day in that realm, okay? But you're making a ton, right? And you're making decisions in situations where if you make the wrong one, you, your partner, or somebody else could die, right? So uh, for those easily triggered or a little, you know, do you have to speak that way? Right. Um, today I will be. Right. I remember one time I was in uh, uh, near Liverpool, England. I was stationed uh, with the army in what was then West Germany. So when uh, my teacher at the time would go to visit one of my uh, friends and peers who lived in Liverpool, right. Um, and, and he would do a seminar then hop in a car and drive up to Ostend, Belgium, hop on the, well, drive onto the ferry and take that across to Dover and then drive up all night long, right? To get to uh, Liverpool for training. And uh, uh, well, not Liverpool, right? So it's across the Mersey River, which is like the roughest river I've ever been on, um, to uh, a section called Wirral. Right. There was a, a boys camp that was over there and that's where my friend would uh, rent the place. And that's where we did the seminar and 
whatever, right? It's really cool. There's indoor facilities, lots of outdoor stuff. So we could do wilderness survival stuff. We could do uh, the stealth training. Could, uh, it was really cool. So, um, but we're, we're, you know, we're in a training session and we're all, we're outside and we're all sitting on the ground. And my, my teacher has this, uh, this uh, training partner that's up there with him. And he says, okay, the next technique we're going to work on is where this guy just grabs you by the back of the head and he punches your face into the back of your skull. Right. And he turns toward his training partner to start the, the demonstration. And this hand goes up. And, you know, yes. And this guy says, must you say that he's punching your face into the back of your skull? That sounds really violent. Can't you just say he's going to strike you about the facial area? And my teacher said, no, he's not going to strike you about the facial area. He's going to try to crush your face back into the back of your skull. Okay. There's, that speaks of intent. Okay. This isn't, if you're being attacked by somebody who's going to strike you about the facial area, right? You don't have a need for 2000 year old secrets. You don't, you, sorry, you just, it's, that's not the way it works. Okay. Um, so I've got this thing popping up on my screen here. Let me see if I can get rid of that. Go away. No, maybe not. Maybe James can handle it anyway. So, um, uh, Decisions, right? Decision making, right? I, I talk about these things all the time, not just decisions. I talk about something that I kind of classify or the, my name for it is soft skills or or the invisible skills, those kind of things, right? Where most people want to focus on the techniques, right? The, the physical block, punch, kick, throw, whatever. And I get it, right? It's that's the most easily quantifiable, right? It's easily gauged. It's probably the easiest to learn, right? Because it has this format and structure. And also, uh, for those of you who uh, are going through the first seven steps on the path program currently, we're going to be going over this uh, this uh, block of instruction that comes out of of that study, right? Uh, out of our Mikyo. We touched on it for those of you who went through the Sanji Chichi Dobon, but if you're not, if you didn't cross over Sanji Chichi to the new program, um, then you, you got to brush over on it. But there's this thing called the five skandhas, right? These five areas of ourselves that um, that we can work on, right? That we can identify and we can work on, okay? Um, and martial artists range heavily in, well, there's, Three areas, three of the five, um, ish, right? There's two strong, one kind of medium. The other ones they're really, really poor at, okay? Um, but one of those ones they're really strong at are the form, the physical, right? What things look like, okay? Um, and then that runs into uh, uh, conceptualization and consciousness, right? Um, feeling and perception, yeah, not so much because they tend to jump. The, the typical martial artist or self-defense practitioner tends to jump over perception or judgment, not in a discerning mindset kind of way, but identifying things as right, wrong, good, bad, just very flat across the board kind of thing, right? So, but anyway, when we go through that in that program, uh, we'll be looking at... Uh, training and and processes and exercises and whatnot to balance that out right so that we're firing on all five pistons and we've got all these five aspects for ourselves um, operating equally before we start moving everything up right because everybody wants to get better but better often has to do with balance or <laughs> not backing up anymore right? Or not increasing the disparity between one part of ourselves or one skill set and another skill set or whatever. And then once they're even, then you can drive the whole friggin' vehicle forward because everything's working well. Okay. It's kind of like uh, having a car and, um, you know, you, uh, you, you got a, uh, two flat tires and you got messed up brakes and, you know, the engine doesn't work, right? 
um, and your steering screwed up, right? So you spend a month working on the engine and then you figure, okay, now it turns over. Great. Right. I'm just going to hop in it and drive. Right. You'll probably get somewhere. I don't know how far, but you get the idea. Right. So, uh, hold on a second. Um, James, are you seeing the, the contact things from restream popping up? Yes. You didn't submit something. You submitted something. Okay. Fair enough. All right. I'll ignore it then. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. All right. I'm just technical issues in the background here. Okay. So, uh, but I'm coming across everything. I'm, I'm coming across well. Everything's good. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. So, okay. So, um, but again, right. There are these soft skills, okay. Everything from being able to assess a situation and recognize what the hell's going on, right? To his fight style, to all kinds of things, right? Um, uh, time management, being able to move when you need to move, not you know, getting caught up thinking about things, right? Controlling your mind and being in the, in the right mind or mental state or mode at different ranges to his ability to get at you. So we're not wasting time um, that we could be using to assess assessments one, right. Um, or we're, we've got all this mental chatter going on or frustration or, um, uh, fear of losing or whatever going on, right. That gets us killed because we're in range and we should be focusing and not talking to ourselves. Okay. Um, anyway, so, uh, there are these soft skills, right? And uh, again, decision making is one of those things. But what I thought would be um, important to talk about today is actually based on another lesson that Hudson Sensei uh, gave. And, uh, and I'm sure it's in books, it's in videos or whatever. Um, I just happened to find a meme that spelled it out one way that he's described it. Okay. So here's the, here's the gist. Okay. What he said was, Remember that for every technique, right, you think that you can fall back on, there is a counter for it. Or there are times when it can't be used, right? It's absolutely inappropriate, right? Or it's, it, you just can't do it, right? So, and he goes on to say, when real battle comes, you must remember that some things will not be applicable. Right? Don't think that any one technique is quintessential, right? Quintessential, for those who are not native English speakers, means that we think that something or looking at something as though it were applicable all the time, right? Or it's this, this central crux, right? Even Taijutsu. Well, that's going to throw some people off, right? That'll just get people to clamp their jaw down or whatever, right? What do you mean not to, not taijutsu, not, uh, not ninjutsu, you know, whatever, okay? Um, one of the lessons I learned was sometimes you don't have time for taijutsu. Sometimes you don't have space for taijutsu. Taijutsu is, is uh, the ideal is footwork or leg work spine work or torso work, and then upper limb work, right? So things come from the ground up, right? Um, if you have Hatsumi Sensei's book, Tokaku Ryu Ninpo, uh, it was translated into English. Uh, I think Richard Van Donk did one. Somebody else maybe maybe helped him or whatever. There's one out in the wind. Um, I got mine, <laughs> like I said, early to mid 80s, just before they went out of print. Um and it, it, it may be out and circulating around anyway, right? But in the chapter on this subject, it says that this is the ideal, okay? Except in times when you can't move your legs or you can't move your legs first, in which case you're going to have to move your torso first, right? Interesting, huh? Right? Um, but also uh, during training, what you find is that there's moments in time where Tajitsu is not applicable, 
tatsu, right? Getting the body weight behind the fist, body in motion, right? Kentaichi Jo, the body and the weapon are one, and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, like, you know, he grabs a hold of me, or we're in this wrestle kind of thing, and his head's right here next to mine, whatever, and I can't move. He's holding me down, right? So it's pressing his head up against mine, or he's got this little shift going on, right? And what I do very, very quickly is I drop, I put my uh, molars together, I drop my jaw, and I turn my head sharply toward him. Bang. And it headbutts him because it's right there. Okay. Right? right. So not exactly tied to two. Okay. Or I'm in a position where, um, you know, I, I step in and I'm doing a, uh, I was going to do a, a rear hip throw or something, right? So my right hand is over on his left chest and I start to go to do things and he steps or neutralizes it, locks up, whatever. And I just take my hand off his chest very quickly, turn it into a copal can, this thumb, you know, middle of the thumb knuckle kind of thing, right? Pop him in the side of the face, okay? Not tied to two, right? I know people like to lump things together, but that's not the ideal, okay? Well, okay, so what are we doing then? Well, I see if we listen to everything Hatsumi Sensei was teaching and we act on it or we at least process it and we don't just stand around like horses eating hay out of a bag or oats out of a bag and just nodding, right? Um, Because we're going to have to reconcile these things, okay? And so uh, one of one of the other quotes that's, that's, be, that's being bandied around on the internet a lot is um, is that if you do something and it works, it's ninja too. Okay. So wait, what the hell? Okay. Um, because it's about producing results anyway. Right. So, um, what I want to do is go back through this, this, not, not the last quote, the previous one, right. Um, about things being fall, or, you know, falling back on. And I want to specifically look at these, uh, a couple of different areas. One, is kata and kata training okay because there's a huge debate out there right do they do they work are they functional that doesn't work in a fight whatever okay and i know we've we've done other episodes i've done whiteboard wednesdays on these things whatever right i'm gonna take a look at self-defense kind of an approach and a mindset right and how uh how that's uh it's kind of a broad term, okay? And then I want to take a look at the battlefield. When he says battlefield, what are we talking about, right? Because th there's 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 words that are thrown around, and I'm not going to split hairs with people, but the words that are being thrown around allow people to feel like feel like okay they're somewhere they may be okay maybe not right or feel like they are something they might be maybe not okay um but it's you know kind of a motivation like, kind of like like sports teams right and there's a huge huge push to, you know, we don't want to offend anybody. So let's change these sports names or whatever. Next thing you know, we're going to have what? Well, maybe we won't. I was just thinking, uh, you know, we'll have uh, the lightning bolts playing the mice, but then, you know, maybe mice will be picked on and they'll be, you know, victimized and whatever. Right. So we can't pick mice. Uh, but anyway, right. So we're going to have passive aggressive terms. Um, but what I'm talking about, war uh, words like warrior, enlightenment right enlighten me well, screw you right i can't enlighten you right you become enlightened about something right you you develop an understanding about something right um i just had some just had some jack wagon uh, james is actually on the on the uh, the prowl hopefully he's got everything settled on his side um that if this person pops up um uh, that they, they he has taken his place as one of only four people in my entire teaching career that I have banned from my dojo, from online activities and all that. And it took him, what, a day and a half, James? About a day and a half, maybe two days. And then he went into a, you know, 
the, the guy's nuts. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll, we'll get off of that. But he's he's watching he's watching for that kind of stuff. But but um, apparently this person is not only a yogi who doesn't believe in doing the physical exercises or the mental work. He's just you know he's not only a yogi, and, and this is spelled out. I have I have well over 200 emails that came in over the course of two and a half, almost three days. Okay. And they're like little texting blurbs. Okay. And I can watch him go through a psychosis, right? No, I'm not a doctor, but I can watch him go through a psychosis. Um, but you know, one will say I'm a yogi. And the next one will say, as a matter of fact, I'm a master yogi. And the next one will say, uh, I'm actually king of the yogi. Okay. Um, so, and this is not, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not. <laughs> so, uh, but again, th this is just an extreme example of the BS that, that people can tell themselves. Right. So anyway, let's go back through this. Right. So uh, remember that for every technique you think you can fall back on, there's a counter for it. Right. Um, or there are times when it cannot be used. So we'll just stop there. Okay. Uh, there are no unbeatable techniques. I hate, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news and to pop people's bubble, but there are no techniques that cannot be beaten. Okay, um, and the sooner we can get our head wrapped around that, then the sooner our training will change. Okay, because one of the uh, one of the things that we work with in the black belt levels, at least in my dojo, is we will take a kata apart. Right, I'm gonna start hinting at kata training. We'll take a kata apart, almost like a story, line for line, okay? So, uh, you know, here's the whole kata, right? Here's the whole thing. But what we'll do is we'll have the attacker throw uh, his thing and the defender, right, the toady, does his thing, right? So there's, there's the kata, right? And then we start playing devil's advocate, okay? So... Let's say it's uh, the kata koku, right? First kata on the first scroll in the Gyoko school, right? First uh, kata on the uh, Jodiaku no Maki, right? Koku, false void, tiger sky, however you want to translate it. Um, so there's a punch, right? You shift back into the inside. You receive it. Uke Nagash, sidestep, uh, shto to the arm to create this opening, right? And to jam them up, Uh so you could finish him, right? Except in that kata, he does a bailout. He saves himself from that shot and throws a kick at your midsection. You shift to clear that, counter kick his incoming leg, which turns him around, and then you come in with uh, one or two boshiken to the base of his spine, just above his hip assembly, so that folds his pelvis forward, causes his knees to buckle, drops him toward the ground, gives you time to draw your sword and finish his ass on the way down. Okay. The finish his ass on the way down is not in the, in the scroll. Just so you're clear about that. Okay. So, <laughs> um, um, so I, I need to wake people up just in case the drone of my voice is, is too mellow or is too, uh, too flat. So uh, what we'll do then is uh, we'll break it down so that uh, the UK throws that first punch, the defender, right? does their uke in the gosh and comes across and does that, uh, that shto. Okay. And the attacker will counter the shuto, right. As in either we'll, we'll do a couple of different ways. They'll ride it off. Um, as in like pull their arm with it so that they neutralize it, relax their shoulder, disengage the unit, right. So that it just kind of flies away, but it doesn't, it doesn't steal their spine. Right, it doesn't lock up their spine, immobilize their feet. You know the goal of all techniques, right? Um, so, uh, and then they'll uh, come back and you know and and do some kind of finish, right? So, the way the kata is set up and the way people get their head wrapped around is that the defender, the initial tori, right, not the person throwing the initial attack, um, is the good guy. So they always win. But that's not the way the universe works. I'm sorry ladies and gentlemen, that's not the way the universe works. Okay. So, well, why would that break? Well, what if my timing was off? What if I took a quarter of a second or half a second too long in writing that uke in the gosh to take that step and deliver that shto and he saw it coming, 
right? Whatever I did when he came in that caused him to miss, right? I, I, I took too much time, right? And so he sees it coming. So his flinch response pulls his arm away, whatever. Or um, my discernment skills, right? Uh, for those of you training in our curriculum, uh, in mod two, we introduce you to a framework called the five D's. Um, and so discern, right? Paying attention to what the hell's going on, not just what he's doing, but when I receive with a nuke in the gosh, what do I feel? Right? Do I have the ability to sidestep, or is he so heavy on my arm I can't move in that direction? Right? And there's already another one coming, and I'm going to have to deal with that one because I wasn't quick enough. I didn't neutralize it. Right? I there's nothing I can do with this at the moment. Right? The next move, remember the quote: "The next move is not doable. It's not applicable. Right? It can't be done." Okay. So, and here's this next one coming in that I've got to deal with. So I shift to that one, right? So discernment is also happening when I receive something. Discernment is happening when I deliver that shto, right? What's the feel of that knife hand blasting his arm away? What's the look of his body locking up and shifting into a bad place, right? What's the, all kinds of things, right? Okay. Um, actually in our modules moving forward in mod two, there's a, the first piece of Koku, this one that I'm describing, right? Shift back, neutralize, come across and hit this arm to open him up. And then immediately we step forward and deliver a palm down knife hand to his face or as a variation. So, so if your body's a little too far back and it feels like it's too hard to get forward fast, then we're going to pick up a kick, right? pick up that lead leg, kick to stall him so that he doesn't throw the next punch and then drop that knife hand on him, right? So there's, there's this piece of Koku in this module. So by the time that somebody gets to Shodan and they're working on Nidan, where this Kata is in our curriculum, they already have this first part, right? So we're already starting to answer the, well, why don't I just do the mod two version? It's, it's easier, right? Well, Okay, but what if I hit this arm or I'm, I'm he's faster than me, whatever. I hit that arm and it didn't do anything to him, right? It's not safe to move in. Well, how the hell would I know if it was safe to move in or not? Unless I actually trained my brain to be paying attention to what the hell's going on. And I'm not just throwing a bunch of shit at the wall, hoping it sticks. Okay, so what, what Hasmi says he's pointing to with this lesson is the need for at least on a mastery level right the maybe not the need for at a mastery level the development of a skill of an ability that cannot be seen it itself is not a self-defense technique but it has everything to do with self-defense right if you're on our foundations of ninja self-defense uh, program our module one um, program. This is week 11 for those of you who started with the, 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 the relaunch, right? Anybody can jump on any time, but here in week 11, right? Uh, one of the, uh, one of the things we're, we're dealing with is this discerning mind, right? Adapting to what's going on with each shot and, you know, knowing whether or not, you can reach like one of the combinations I show this week. Um, he throws a straight punch. I shift to the uh, outside in a Jumonji, but also forward, right? Because I want my my shoulder. I want the sole day of the armor. I want my shoulder to be at or beyond his el the point of his elbow toward uh, on the upper arm side. So my body position itself checks and and, and removes his ability to just elbow me as a, as a follow up even if he saw me move. Okay. But anyway, so one of the models that I show is I move forward, I ram his ribs with uh, the elbow, right? And then I drop two more punches in on his, on his uh, ribs or his uh, hip socket or whatever, and then kick his leg out from under him, take him down, that kind of thing. Right. Um, but there's another version that I give where I shift to a slightly different position and I make it a clear point in that, in that uh, video 
to let people know that, look, I am not, I'm not going to throw the elbow right now. Right. James, remember when we were shooting that, um, I, I specifically stopped and looked at the camera and said, look, I'm not throwing the elbow at this point. I'm going to do something different. And here's why. All right. And I brought my elbow around so that everybody could see that it was not going to hit his ribs. Okay. I was just out of range. Okay. One of the soft skills is, do you know the length of your different body parts from shoulder to elbow, from elbow to wrist, from wrist to, okay? Because that's how we gauge measure. That's how we measure things, right? That way we're not just throwing shit out there. And again, it clipped him, but it didn't do anything. I'm sorry. That's the same as missing, okay? And if you miss, it's a wasted shot. Our job is to make him miss, not not understand our stuff to the degree where when our life or safety is on the line or somebody else we care about when their safety is on the line, we couldn't hit the broad side of a fucking barn because we're not training for precision or uh, we, we don't know which body or, you know, I'm, I'm at elbow range and I'm trying to hit him with a fist. Yeah, I hit him, but I, I had to like jack things around and torque my body to be able to get that shot in there. Right. We see this with, with, uh, uh, mod one people when they're demonstrating uh, white belts, yellow belts. Uh, yes, we have different colors than most people are used to. And you'd have to be in the program to understand the logic. But anyway, um, uh, what we'll have them do is uh, come my evasion with some kind of follow up okay, during a test. And so they'll avoid. And that was pretty decent. And then they'll hit something that the target itself you're not doing anything, right? Um, it doesn't, it, it, it's not going to debilitate them. It's not going to slow them down um, or the way they had to torque themselves to hit it, right? Or the commitment they had to it or whatever, right? It's a wasted shot, okay? Um, what you just communicated to that person was you don't know what the hell you're doing and their job's easy, okay? And they're going to be smiling while they drive you into the ground, okay? So, now, that's not to say that my Sandan or my Nidans who are working on Sandan and above won't do something like that to convince him that they don't know what they're doing. So when he and when his confidence gets uber inflated and he starts throwing caution to the wind and he doesn't think he needs to pay that much attention because it's an easy kill, then he runs into a different problem. Okay. So, but here's the thing, right? Um, so let's go back to the Kata thing. Right? Again, I'm just one little model and I'm going to go back and then take a look at this. Right. So we'll have the, the, the attacker, right? I'll just use attacker and defenders is easier at the moment. Right. They throw that punch. We step back. Okay. And the gosh, I come across and I, I deliver the show and he counters it. Right. He, he, uh, pulls his arm or whatever. So when I miss with that strike, I'm now open and he comes in and we give the attacker a logical finish from that position based on the, the, the move that they were in. Right. So here's what happened. Right. In that, in that little scenario there, the attacker won, not the defender. Okay. And then we go back to it. Right. And look at the kata from the perspective of how do I beat that thing, right? And it might be I go to do this shto, right? He pulls his arm away and throws another punch and the kata resets and I get another chance to go through it, right? And then, you know, I get to do the next piece and finish. So defender wins, okay? But then we go to the next piece, right? Because what if he didn't beat the shuto? but he beat the next piece, right? So basically what we're doing with the kata, and it doesn't matter if it's moguri, dori, seon, shiaku, koku, it doesn't matter, right? What we do is we play a game of, of defender wins, attacker wins, defender wins, attacker wins, defender wins, attacker wins, defender wins, okay? Because what I want students to understand and what my teachers needed me to understand is that Whoever does the most number of right things at the right time and the least number of mistakes at the right wrong times, okay, um, universal justice says they get to win, okay? 
You don't get to win just because you think you're the good guy. You don't get to win just because you have Nijutsu on your side or you have Bujinkan on your side or you have whatever, okay? Um, that's that's the second part of the, uh, the, the quote, right? When real battle comes, you must remember that some things are uh, will not be applicable. Don't think that any one technique is quintessential. Don't think that any style that you have is quintessential, right? You need to be freaking paying attention, right? Reality is, is that... Um, whoever does the right number of, okay. So um, in the Gilko school, this is actually shown. Um, I, I apologize to those of you who are uh, on audio only, because we have more people listening into that than we do uh, with the, uh, the live video, but that's okay. Right. So for those of you on live video, you're going to see this, right. But for those on audio, I'm going to describe it to the best of my ability. Right. So if you bring your hands together, palm to palm, and then you bring them together and interlace your fingers and then press the palms together, okay? This is a mudra, right? Um, it's a form of an outer bonds fist, but it's not, it, it's not, it's not this, mm, there's a kuji one where the fingers are, are in on the inside, right? This one, it's on, it's on the outside. Don't worry about it too much, right? But this, this is a connection, understanding kind of thing, right? That things are intertwined, okay? Musubi, musubu, right? to to tie to not to to bind together that kind of thing right so uh and then there's a there's a mantra and what I'm, I'm this is not an initiation to those kind of things but there's this mudra that you do um in, in the gyoko to you there are these three full body mudra um especially in the first level of training but they do get associated to each of the each of the scrolls as well but they're associated with a mindset and a realization that the warrior must have right in that moment or something that would help right um because if they don't have those things they have no business being in that moment and this is a huge difference between a fighter and a warrior Okay, so with this mudra, right, there is a recognition that universal justice will win out, okay? And justice is not, this is not a justice like I'm righteous and I'm the good guy and he's the bad guy, so I'm going to win. It's not a religious belief thing. It's not a righteousness thing. Universal justice is cold. And the recognition here is whoever does the most number of right things and the least number of wrong things at the right and wrong time, universal justice says they get to win because both people think they're right. Okay. This is not a one guy's right and one guy's wrong. That's an ego thing. Okay. So the recognition is this is the way it's going to work. And if I'm not okay with that, I have no business standing in this spot. Okay. This is not a, well, let's just go to town and see what happens, right? Let's just let's just see who's going to be, right? This is not about bragging rights afterwards, right? Because there's other mudra and mantra that go along with these that one of them plugs his heart into heaven, okay? It removes you from the equation, your ego from the equation, right? Where you're, you're acting as a tool for, and I don't mean like a tool, Right. I mean, a weapon, a tool, you know, a, a tool from a toolbox, not a tool like you're being used. Right. I guess maybe it's the same. Anyway, so um, you are stopping evil because somebody has to. Right. So, but this is not about your desires. This is, this person is doing truly bad stuff and they have to be stopped. Okay, so you step up. This is not, he called you a name. He called your mom a name. He called you whatever. You're defending your sister's honor because somebody painted the word whore on the, on the side of the water tank or the water tower. What, this is not that kind of bullshit stuff. Okay, um, this is <laughs> serious shit, right? So, but you're removing yourself, right? So you're not going to act unless... 
there's a right, there's a difference between righteousness, right? Self-righteousness, right? Us righteousness. We're the good guys, right? And rightness. Okay. This is right and appropriate in the moment. Okay. This needs to be done. Okay. Uh, so there's that. And then there's another one that uh, is, is another mentality kind of thing, but it gets you out of a imperative need to win fear of losing mindset. Okay. So there's all these little mindsets that are going on, right? That we need to get under control. Um, otherwise, we're just another fighter with a style, right? We're just another whatever, okay? So, but people like to believe that, um, you know, I, I, I trained in this art, right? And again, we're talking about this one, but it could be any art because ego will grab a hold of it, right? I'm doing it, so it must be the best, right? If it wasn't, if it was, if it wasn't the best, I wouldn't be doing it. Right. So, um, but then they think that it's applicable all the time. Well, I got to tell you, as a police officer, Taekwondo kicks are not applicable almost ever. Right. Because too big, flashy, obviously you're trying to kick the guy in the head. It obviously fighting, uh, not defense and control. It's, it's not the same. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of things, right? On top of that, you're wearing body armor, you're in boots, you got uh, how many pounds around your waist, right? Lean back with that kick and see what happens, right? Um, anyway, so, uh, but people will fall back on those kind of things. As a matter of fact, th this was a bunch of years ago. Um, that will just happen. Am I still on? My screen just like seriously dimmed out. Are we good? Wow. All right. Anyway, a bunch of years ago, I think there's something wrong with the system tonight because it seems to be a little on the slow side. Yeah, that's really weird. Anyway, um, you know, let's get, let you know, before I, I talk about it, before I share this story, let's just check to see what people are experiencing, right? Does anybody see a slowdown? Anybody? Um, what, are you, what are you getting? I mean, James, I think you see it. Um, I have all these screens open or something. With, anyway, you're going to get rid of that. Ha ha. Ta da. Uh, did that fix it? Maybe the system resources were eaten up by all the, uh, all the frames. How are we doing now? Looks faster on my side. Yes. All right. We have any comments, anything? And no. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, anyway, a bunch of years ago, I remember uh, this is when forums were big and, and all that stuff. I think it's slowing down again. Anyway, um, this, this person, there was this discussion about um, adaptive topics and Henka and whatever. And I remember this one person chiming in that if they could not begin with XYZ technique, XYZ, come I, whatever, they were lost. Holy shit. I hope that if you're worried about self-defense or you find yourself on that battlefield, that they throw the attack that, that the be at least the beginning of that technique would be appropriate for. Because there's a problem with having favorites. Okay. James, I don't, I'm going to fire you up over here. Right. Um, What's one of the things that I tell students in class all the time about favorites? <clears throat> you shouldn't have one. But nobody should be able to look at you from across the room and know which side is your favorite. Okay. No favorite sides. You need to be equally good. And this, this actually came from Ishizuka Sensei, right? Equally good on both sides, right? And what does equally good mean? That means that a master of the of the or an expert or whatever should be able to stand across the room, look at you and not be able to discern which is your strong side, weak side, favorite side, good side, bad side, whatever. Okay. Um, for the primary reason that you don't know where they're coming from. I just covered this with somebody, um, one of my black belts uh, last week. They're, they're, in a, they're having some health issues and whatnot. So they're training from home. 
And so we were taking a look uh, in our in our dojo. We have this. Uh, we used tape and stuff to put on the floor. Made this big uh, eight spoked wheel, right? This big asterisk on the ground. And we were discussing the Kionapo principle, right? Um, of normally, you know, well, we're we're going to sidestep Kionapan. We're going to sidestep eight techniques and go to the original principle that Takamasa Sensei. Uh, taught. So most people, I, I think, can get their head wrapped around that you get any given technique, you make eight variations of that, and then each variation, you make eight variations of it, whatever, until the original model just becomes an option among options, right? But there's other ways to look at the Kyonopo principle, and one of those is, uh, I think what I was discussing with her was Kamai training, Kamai practice. And so, uh, you know, make one of these these asterisks make one of these eight spoked wheels, right? You make a plus sign on the floor with some tape. Um, you're going to need a lot, right? Cause you need to see uh, the line of the attack and stuff like that. But anyway, you make a plus sign and then you overlay an X over top of that plus sign. And now you've got an eight spoke wheel. You got eight directions. Okay. So normally when people first start off, they work, uh, uh, they work rear, Naname, right? So left and right Naname uh, to the rear, right? Di this diagonal, right? So let's say I'm using Ichimonji. Uh, I'm going to step from Shizen into Ichimonji or Seigon or whatever, right? So if I'm going to the left, I'm going to step back into the left with my left foot. Right foot's going to step back into my right with my right foot, but I'm on these, I'm on these angles, right? Um, but ultimately, and, and, and when I step back, my lead arm is pointing at the hub it's pointing where i was standing because that's where he was coming right um but ultimately i need to be able to go straight back this left and right rear not a may i need to be able to go directly to the right side directly to the left again every time i step i'm pointing back to the hub okay i'm pointing back in the in the direction i came from i need to be able to step forward left and right not a may right while rotating and pointing back at the hub right and straight forward. And in this case, when I step straight back or straight forward, I need to be able to rotate left or right to point back at the hub. Okay. Why am I pointing back at the hub? James, why am I pointing back at the hub? Because that's where the attacker is. Okay. We're assuming that if we're moving, okay, we're moving away from the attacker. Yeah, but what if we're moving forward? Well, then I'm not turning around. I'm it, I'm delivering a strike. Okay. But this now accounts for the attacker coming from any angle around me. And I'm moving away, shifting into position so I can get an uke nagash in there, or at the very minimum, right, evading a kumai. Okay? It doesn't matter. It becomes, everybody trains like, when I say everybody, I mean like 98.2%, right? Uh, I made that number up. Anyway, so, but they always train like you were always going to be nose to nose. Like this guy's going to be nice enough to come at us from the front. Sorry, but if you're, you know, if you're training for Nidon, you definitely need to be training for them at least coming in from within your peripheral vision. Okay. From fifth down and above, you're supposed to have that, that fifth down test was supposed to be an initiation into the realm of intuitive knowing. Okay. So now he can come in on my blind sides. Okay. And I didn't hear him, didn't see him, but I still need to move away from that thing. Okay. So, but there's, there's this, right. And then branch that out to your kata. Start with your, your, uh, Sanden kata from the Gyoko school, right. The first three techniques and the, what everybody knows is the Kiona Po, right. So do Ichimonji no kata in all eight directions. Do Jumonji no kata in all eight directions. Right? Okay. Hichi all eight directions. Okay? Right? Um, but again, are you going to be doing the kata on the street? I don't know. Probably not, but hopefully there's going to be some vestige of that stuff in if you've trained hard enough that it gets into muscle memory. But I don't think about doing kata on the street. What I think about is assessing, observing, and responding based on the pieces, but everything is a reflection of the principles and concepts. What is this principles and concepts you speak of? Well, that's what you get to 
beyond form. Okay. So let, let, let's do this, right? I, I don't want to belabor this too much, but what I definitely wanted to go into during, you know what, before I do this, um, any questions or comments other than highs? I, I mean, I'll answer the highs. That's, that's all great. Not if they're high, I don't want to talk to them, but okay. <laughs> I already have enough problem with somebody who either are they're either on the wrong meds or they um, they should be on meds. No questions or comments, just the highs. And everybody said that <clears throat> they're seeing everything. You're coming through. Okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right. Anyway. All right. So uh, let's talk about something that was actually a part of <laughs> my martial arts training. Uh, one of my teachers, um, which is which is why whenever I wrote to Hatsumi Sensei, and the way I think about Hatsumi Sensei, and the way I think about most, not all, but most of my martial arts teachers in this art who taught more than physical technique, who taught more than kata, who did more than just the uh, the taiden, right? Transmission of the physical stuff, right? Um, I don't tend to think of them in terms of sensei or shidoshi or daishihan or whatever, okay? The Japanese word I was taught uh, to use by a native Japanese speaker who I hired as a tutor uh, is shiso, S-H-I-S-O. If you use the Hepburn style, it's S-H-I-S-O-U. The U just tells you to hold the O a little bit longer. Shiso, okay? So shiso is a teacher of life. So now we really are talking about like a mentor, somebody that's taking you under their wings or whatever. And they're not just, they're not just conveying data. They're not just, you know, here's a technique, here's a technique, here's a technique, right? Here's a training drill, here's a technique, here's a training drill with a technique, whatever, okay? So uh, they're helping to cultivate you right? Which is why we have those three areas of training. We have Taiden, which is the teacher transmitting the, the physical stuff, the kata, the skills, rolling, you know, whatever, training drills. How do you use your body well? Okay. And then there's the Kuden. Huh. Where'd that come from? Anyway, so <laughs> Kuden, here we are on Kuden, right? It's the knowledge, right? being shared, perspective, those kind of things, right? Um, and then there's something that only comes from an actual connection with and a bond, a literal teacher-student relationship, which is very much like a parent-child relationship, except that it's two grown adults who can go their own way at any, any time, right? And it's the Shinden, Okay, Shinden, not the same as the Shinden on, on the Kamiza in a lot of dojo. But it's kind of the same, right? It's the spirit, right? The spirit transmission is the, the life lessons, right? Um, going deeper and beyond just, you know, which, which scroll and which lineage is this particular kata on? When was this lineage founded? I can recite all the grandmasters' names in chronological order. <whistles> okay, great. Um, but what kind of person are you? Can you survive? I don't care what. Will you persevere? What's your decision-making abilities like? Are you willing to make decisions? Or are you afraid of being wrong? All that kind of stuff, right? So Taiden, Kuden, Shinden. Three different routes for training, but it's three aspects of the training and teaching and connection that comes with a teacher-student relationship, okay? Um, I think that's that's really difficult for people to get their head wrapped around in the West because, you know, we go to a teacher, we give them money or whatever, and they teach me moves, right? One of my other jokes in a dojo is I would make a whole lot more money if I put a drive-up window system in my dojo. Okay. Pull up the window number one or technique 26, pay me, 
pull up to window number two, which would be sliding glass doors just in case you ordered a kick, right? Um, we would apply the technique to you, give you the video, say, see you next time, okay? I think I'd make a whole lot more money, but I'm not willing to put holes in the side of the building. So anyway, um, so let's let, let's take a look at this, right? Okay, so there are three words that are interspersed a lot. It's kind of like that, that uh, and there's a couple of other words in here. I already mentioned enlightenment, uh, wisdom, mastery, that kind of stuff, right? There's, there's three words that kind of get mixed up. And if we don't understand that there's a process and things come in at one place and as they're worked, they get to the next and as they're worked, they get to the next, right? It's the process, okay? And these three words are information, knowledge, and wisdom. And you can replace wisdom with the word enlightenment or mastery. I don't care because it points to the same thing, right? And this is not merely skill development. This is not just like I learned to move and I know the move and like I'm like super fast with the move and I never make a mistake with it. Okay. Um, that's actually in the first level. Okay. Information is nothing but data. You saw a technique, you learned a technique, right? It's the, it's the learning process. Okay. This is the, uh, let, let's use something more simple. Right. Hopefully everybody can keep up with this and your parents didn't just get you slip on shoes or Velcro, but tying shoes. OK, you learn to tie the loop and whatever. Right. For tying shoes. OK, your fingers cramp, uh, you know, eventually you get it. But the bow's too far away from the tongue of the shoe and you're not really holding the shoe together. So it's still loose on your foot, whatever. Right. And finally. Right. You keep working with this. Right. So just tying the tying the loop and you get that part. Right. If you've ever had kids and you've helped them. Right. Um, it's a struggle because they don't want to do it because it's a struggle. Right. They don't understand why it's important. They don't. Whatever. OK. We have the benefit in the martial arts that people have. There's a cool factor. And as long as it's cool and it's flashy. Right. And it, I think I'm going to, you know be the the talk of the town the chicks are gonna love me or the guys are gonna love whatever right um or uh whatever it is right then then i'm willing to do it okay which is what precludes a lot of people from mikyo training because there's things in mikyo and there's actually stuff in traditional japanese martial arts where um the teacher gives you something that may or may not make any sense and um you're not allowed to ask why when would this be appropriate? Why, when, when whatever. Because it doesn't matter because you can't do it yet. Okay. Westerners loathe that kind of stuff. Right. We always want to know why. Right. And if, if you can't tell me why, or if I don't think that it has any kind of appropriate or, a, 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 you know, meaningful context or whatever, no, I'm not going to do it. Okay. Even if you nod at your teacher and go, yes, I'll practice. And you're going to go home and not practice. Okay, because you don't trust your te teacher deeply enough. Well, I do trust my teacher. Yeah, only if he or she's giving you exactly what you think you should be getting. But then if you knew that, then you'd be the teacher. Anyway, or the king of the yogi. Anyway, so um, <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's like the Chinese water torture. Anyway, right. Uh, so. Uh, so information, right? Information is just data, right? Uh, once I learned how to say, hello, how are you in Russian? I don't know how to say, hello, how are you in Russian? I could look it up, right? We could all look it up. Hell, we have Google, right? But we didn't have Google. <laughs> but anyway, I learned it, right? But you know what? I don't know how to say, hello, how are you? In... Well, how can you, How? what do you mean? You learned it. How do you not know it? Because I didn't practice it enough to not be able to forget it. 
So when we practice a skill or we practice a technique, practice tying our shoes, right? To the point that we get it right, still in learning phase, still in information phase. So we get it right and we don't have to think about it while we're doing it. And there's a really, really, really low chance of getting it wrong. Okay. If you know how to drive, you know how to drive. You know which way to turn the steering wheel, how, how much, depending on the turn you're on, whatever. You know how to go from the accelerator to the brake because you know exactly where those pedals are. Last time you stubbed your toe uh, on the brake pedal because you were aiming for the accelerator uh, was probably, I don't know, never. Okay. Um, same thing, right? You took your foot from the accelerator, moved it over to press on the brake, and you got your shoe caught underneath or behind the brake pedal, right? No, okay? because it's in muscle memory. Okay? So knowledge is being able to do something and not have to remember how to do it. If you're still looking down at your feet when you're going into Kamai, or you're still checking your chest position, or you're still then no, we're still in learning phase. Okay, it's still information. Okay? The brain is still being overtaxed while it's trying to do it. Okay, you can do whatever you want, but I would highly recommend that you not use those techniques on the battlefield. You could try them in a self-defense situation, depending on the gravity, but I'm making a, just like we're using information, knowledge, and wisdom, I'm differentiating between kata and I mean all technique training. I don't care if it's a skill, drill, formal kata, whatever. Self-defense that I've got an edge over just about anybody, but it's typically somebody coming at me, uh, probably not looking to kill me. Okay. It's not, it's not that kind of catastrophic situation. And then the battlefield. You're probably going to die. Okay. What can I do to minimize that likelihood? Okay. This is warriorship. If you're in, if you're in a situation as a warrior and shit's flying around, you're probably going to die. Okay. That's why that that's everything that's behind the saying that the warrior accepts death. That doesn't mean the warrior wants to die. But he or she knows that if they step up, it's a good chance that's going to happen. Okay. So, and again, that's why Hatsumi said, say, over the years, kept saying there's a huge difference between martial arts and real Budo. And again, 92.8% of the people just regurgitate the saying because Sensei said, Sensei said, Sensei said. Yeah, since they said a lot of things that you can't remember because it was either uncomfortable or it wasn't cool enough. Okay. So, uh, but there's a huge difference, right? Because one, you know, you, there's a certain context and we're training for a certain context for certain reasons. But Budo, Bujutsu? Somebody's dying. Okay. Anyway, let's get back to this, right? So information, it's knowledge. It's, it's the learning process. Okay. But just because I know it, see, people will learn the, the, you know, um, you know, somebody will teach you how to say something like, uh, one really formal way to say thank you in Japanese. Okay. So most people know, don't worry about gozaimasu, right? Or don't worry about or arigato, right? Arigato, thanks. Don't worry about Thank you. Okay. Um, actually, it means thanks indeed, uh, literally. But, and then adding uh, gozaimasu, right, makes it very formal. Thank you very much. It's the way we would say it, but it's a formality kind of thing. But any of those is thanking somebody for doing something that was generally expected. Or uh, like I, I, I asked for somebody, I asked for help. Right, on the right? I ask for help. They give me help. 
Domo arigatou gozaimasu. Right? Thank you very much. Okay? But when somebody does something for you that goes way beyond, way beyond, like it was completely unexpected, okay? It's gokuro sama deshita. Okay? So say that. Gokuro sama deshita. Gokuro sama deshita. Congratulations. You just learned how to say thank you very much for something that you did that was above and beyond in Japanese. Okay. At the end of this, kuden, now say I'm going to issue a challenge and ego is going to write it down so that you can not forget it. But if you have to look it up, you don't know it. It's only until you practice it. Right. I don't have anything on any notes around here. Right. Go to some of Right. It's in there. Okay? You don't have to think about all the words you use every day when you're having conversations with people. You move your mouth, you push air across your vocal cords, and you say what you mean to say. Well, sometimes we stick our foot in our mouth, but you know what I mean. <laughs> you, you don't have to think about how to speak English. It just, just just comes out. Okay, So you know that to the point where you can't get it wrong. Okay, So learning it, information, right? It came in, learned how to do this kamai, right? Right. But do you know how to do the kamai? Well, yeah, I just step back and I do that. Okay. So if I apply some stress, if I apply some pressure, if I surprise you, that's what you're going to go to. When your left brain shuts down for a, for a second or three or 10 or whatever, and your body flinch response goes to this, that's what it's, that's what it's going to look like. Well, I mean, I still have to think about, well, then you're not in knowing phase. Okay. So what's this wisdom phase? Wisdom is knowing when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, when it works, when it doesn't work. Like, sega no kamai. Okay. Done the way most people do it in the context of most, most people's training format right where they either step straight back or they step back naname right sagan most some people still call it ichimonji whatever okay um does not work against a right hook or a left hook doesn't hook up uh, work against a haymaker okay because of your balance line and the impact of that against your arm right if you're making it work it's because you're changing things and you're leaving yourself open in other directions a right hook, right cross, haymaker, whatever, will knock your arm to the side, break your balance, and cause you to stumble, and then he hits you with the next one. Okay? Remember what I said, the way most people do it. Okay? So I need to understand that, okay, Nagash, receiving it or avoiding it, right? Because I don't have to touch him to do the okay, Nagash, okay? Um, is based on the line of the attack just before it hits me. So a haymaker's coming in from a different angle, right cross coming in from a different angle than ski, than this straight on shot that most people practice from. But if that's all I ever practice from, then that's all that's the only thing I know how to how to avoid with the system that I'm learning. Okay. What about an uppercut? What about a diagonal uppercut? Um, this designed to come up and and shove the floating rib back into your organs, right? Spleen on one side, kidney on the other. If you've ever taken a shot to your floating rib and it's punched into your kidney and you've had bruising or that organ's been messed up for a couple of days, like not bleeding, whatever, it's more than a couple of days. It's weeks, like going into months. Okay. I don't have it now. Past experience. Okay. So, uh, but knowing. Right. Knowing is how to I, I know how to go into this into position, right? I've learned right that I should go into these different angles, right? But I know do I know which angle? See, if I know which angle and which come I would be better, because if I have to move forward to the inside of his body, he throws a punch and I'm moving where I'm aligned with his chest, then um Sagan may or may not be, or Ichimonji may or may not be the right answer because he has another hand. Depending on where that hand is, you better determine where my rear hand is. And maybe I'm maybe I go to Doko, 
Maybe I go to Hoko. Maybe I go to Kosei. Whatever. Okay. But my limbs should track his to cover. And if you look at your Kamai, you have dots on a dot to dot picture. Okay. So which reference point based on what he's doing? Right. My ability to do that without thinking about it, just intuitively knowing, and my body just goes there. Okay. Because I'm not looking at what everybody else is looking at. Not me. Right. Because I'm still working on this stuff. Too, right. When I say I, I mean the person who's there. Okay. Um, okay. I can do it pretty well. Anyway. So um, when you're doing it, if you have to think about which one, okay, you know how to do it, but the wisdom, or I'm going to change the word out from wisdom to mastery, okay, is he throws up just this hot fireball at you. You shift to not get hit and do something from there. And you don't remember what you did. But if somebody showed you a video later, okay, I went to that come I, I went to that come I or whatever. But when your left brain bailed on you, there was some part of you that knew exactly where to put body parts. Okay. That's mastery. And this speaks directly to in the Tagagi Yoshin school, right? Tagagi Yoshin view. Oriomo Tagagi, long story with him, right? But anyway, when he developed that school okay um there were these different levels of balance breaking kazushi right because it's a central principle for for tagagi ocean and so being able to break somebody else's balance and take them down effortlessly would seem like to most people to be the top Right, and we're that's that's what we're aiming for, but it's not the top in Tagagi Ocean. The top in Tagagi Ocean is breaking your own balance, and I don't mean breaking your own balance physically, right? Because you need to do things like that to do STEMI, right? Sacrifice, whatever, right? Um, but it's not that. The definition of that type of balance breaking is you did something in an engagement that surprised you. Like, how the hell did I know to do that? Okay. That is above everything. Okay. If we're looking at Ukemi, let's back down to Ukemi, right? Or back down, let's let's back down to well, we'll tie ukemi in, right? So you sh your ukemi should be developing right along with your training partners. Uh, let's say your training partner is working on uh, gyakute or throws or whatever, right? Your ukemi needs to be developing in alignment with that, okay? Or your ukemi needs to be developing in alignment with your own ability to lock, hold, or throw, okay? Because if you're training correctly, then you're picking up the speed. And so at a certain point, you're going to have to not be able to think about which break fall, which direction, whatever. And it has to be intuitive feel. Okay? And your body just knows how to take up the right position. Like when I slipped on that ice, was it three years ago? Something like that, right? And uh, broke that transverse process piece at the base of my back, right? Saved everything else right? Because it came down the point of concrete steps, just in case anybody missed that one, right? Um, I had a couple of people go, well, I guess your break fall sucked. Really? I saved my skull. I didn't break anything else, okay? And it was just a small piece, right? Because I landed on a chisel of concrete, right? But I didn't have to think about it. That happened so fast that if I had to think about put my molars together drop my chin to my chest so that my head is up off the ground and round out my shoulders, it would never happen, okay? We would not be having this conversation because I have no doubt that where I fell and how I came down based on the number of steps, okay, and where the back part, right, because my legs were down on the, the uh, 
part of our back walk, right? Um, so I came down pretty, pretty deep, right? Um, I would have either broken my neck or um, I'd have cracked my skull open and bled to death right there. Right? So the skill for Ukemi at full speed, okay? At full speed. That'd be awesome, okay? But if my partner's skill set is going up, he's not just doing, see, the, the top part of, let's say, doing Osotonage, the rear hip throw or um, whatever, right, is not being able to do the introductory model at full speed. It's being able to do it at full speed and take away his ability to do ukemi. Well, shit. If I were to do that to my training partner, my training partner is going to get busted up. And I don't mean like bruised and limping home. I mean, okay, if you can't take ukemi, this is not going to work so well. Right? There's only so much you can do on mats because it's going to compromise your balance or whatever. Okay? So the next level up, because my partner can only be able to, he can only do ukemi at full speed. There is nothing beyond ukemi at full speed. But skill-wise, with my throw, beyond full speed, take his ability to, to take ukemi, take it away from him. Okay? What I'm left with is I have to be able to recognize at the moment that my partner cannot take ukemi and then gear down my technique so I can help to help him save himself. I save him after I've taken him. Okay. So very different. It's a very different level. Okay. So from a kata perspective, and again, I'm, I'm just using kata as a fill in for skill, skill proficiency. Okay. From a self-defense perspective, right? This is all about liability consciousness. Okay. Because there's a huge difference between fighting, between a self defense situation, and a military or paramilitary action, or let's call it self defense in a just, <laughs> this is not just a shitty situation. This is, you're supposed to die, figure out how to not or reduce the, or uh, mitigate the, the damage to the greatest degree possible so that you don't, even if a body part doesn't function as well as it could for the rest of your life. Okay? So not the same. Okay? In martial arts class, there's all kinds of safeties built in. Okay? We're training with kata. There's a there's a paradigm. Okay? There's a, there's a structure. Right? Step one, step two, step three. Even we're doing, uh, you know, randori. We're doing sparring, whatever, right? There's there's safety mechanisms built in and all that, right? Um, unless you're doing kumite, in which case, see, I'm, I have my own thoughts. That, that, that'll be for a different day. A self-defense situation, right? Self-defense in most places in the world is a legally definable situation okay the typical the the standard self-defense sometimes even uh in in law enforcement and security you have the um the use of force doctrine okay so self-defense doctrine so uh use of force doctrine and both of these are just these just if they're written they're just these narrowly a couple of sentences right but they both involve using minimum force necessary to neutralize the situation. Okay. So self-defense is the first action or the minimum steps taken to stop the assault. Okay. Use of force doctrine is pretty much the same thing. Minimum force necessary to bring the, the assailant under or the perpetrator um, under control to control the situation. Okay. If I go beyond that, then it's assault or it's attempted murder or it's murder. Okay. See, in a catastrophic situation, lines get blurred on a battlefield, on a little a literal battlefield. I know there are rules of engagement, but you know, those of us, uh, uh, you know, here in the States, I'm sure uh, Canada, most of the Western world. Okay. 
Um, see, we already signed the Geneva and Hague conventions and all that kind of stuff. But what most people don't ever give, give any thought to is that um, until we've been attacked by an army or invader or whatever, terrorist organizations, that kind of thing, right? These people have never signed these these doctrine or these documents or these these rules for warfare. So here we are fighting with rules against people that, right? Unless we win and force them to sign it, right? To bring them under some kind of control, hopefully, right? Didn't work between World War One and World War Two. Um, but uh, then you get a problem, right? But self defense is liability conscious, you got to worry about legal, both civil and criminal, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, but when things escalate and you're pretty sure that this person's got murder on the mind, right? That kind of thing, right? Or you're on a lot of literal battlefield. And when I keep saying literal battlefield, I mean you're in a theater of operation, as we would call it in the military. Uh, but you could be in a back alley, right? You could have turned off the wrong exit and stopped to ask for directions or needed gas or whatever, and you're just in a wrong freaking neighborhood, okay? And this is not calling anything anything, right? This is not about anybody, anywhere. We all know that there are pockets of places like that. Some are in inner cities. Some are in small town somewhere this is not a whatever right um and now you got what you got right so um in each of these situations i in in the dojo right we'll go back to that not uh, uh you know the brush uh, wrong brush on the battlefield it's not one forgiven easily Right. Mistakes in the dojo are forgiven like candy being passed out at a Halloween parade. Right? That's the place to make mistakes. Self-defense situation. Think about this. The way we're training. Okay, if you look at statistics, which is why our foundations of ninja self-defense program um, is laid out the way it's laid out. Right. There are very specific types of attacks that make up 95 to 98% of the assaults that occur every day. And I don't mean simple assaults like somebody's calling you names or whatever, right? I'm talking about aggravated assault, right? Um, or, well, there's simple assault, there's assault, and there's aggravated assault, at least in my jurisdiction, right? So um, all of those. All the ones that are statistically laid out, we have, again, we have in our, so if you're going through the foundations program, all those attacks, right? Bear hugs, uh, double grabs, single grabs, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, uh, in a couple, in a week or two coming up here, you're going to have uh, chokes and stuff from the rear, whatever, right? Um, all these things are easily handled by, by what we consider to be basics, okay? So that, those are the things that, I think everybody needs to get and get as quickly as possible, which is why I put it in our first module. But um, it's it's still a lower key kind of situation. Not that it should be, you know, we should be overconfident or whatever. I'm not saying that it's not dangerous. It is. But we're talking about degrees here. Okay. When I say battlefield, it could be back alley could be your home office during an active shooter situation. It could be, uh, it could be not home office, but your home, you know, your, op, your workplace, right. Could be your home, could be whatever, right. Where this is not, right. This is not somebody pushing, shoving. This is not somebody angry, throwing a punch at you. This is no, okay. This is, th this is, this is very different, right. Um, there's a forgiveness sliding sliding scale that goes on through this right when he's talking about when he when he says the wrong brush on the battlefield right it's it's technique choice strategy tactic whatever right so almost all is forgiven in the dojo almost okay um self-defense situation 
Okay, depends on the mistake. A battlefield, a really bad situation, a catastrophic situation. Every mistake comes with a heavy cost. Okay, so if we're not working on discernment if we're not working on assessment skills, if we're not working on decision-making, if we don't get really, really, really fucking good at not only making decisions, but acting on them to get whatever done. And while I'm doing the do, while I'm working on it, right? Getting feedback, right? To make sure that I'm on course and can make these little adjustments as you go. Um, when Manaka Sensei was still in the Bujinkan way back in the 80s um, when I was training with him, um, he was always talking about konsetsu waza, right? Joint locks and things like that. But after you took the person down, moving into a position to, to lock them up, right? And he said, this is a constant, right? There's a, it's a constant um, adjustment process, okay? Until you find that point that where you have him locked and if he moves, he will break himself, okay? You don't have to do anything at that point, okay? You can, but... If he moves, he will break himself. This is very different from I drop somebody and move into position and I just stop moving because I just make the assumption that, you know, this is how you do it. Okay? And then my partner slips it and then I have to scramble to catch it. No, it's it's a constant, right? But you know what? Moving in to do a throw, applying a joint a joint lock, uh, doing Ichimoji no Kata, any of these things, right? There's a constant adjustment. Because if I'm only going through the moves and I'm not paying attention to where he's moving and what he's doing, right? If it, okay, we can go right back to what the kata training that I talked about in the beginning was like, right? I'm supposed to win this. Yeah, well, tough shit. Guess what? Okay, you took too much for granted. You thought your technique or your art or whatever was quintessential, right? Just applicable all the time. And again, you weren't paying attention and, well, explain that to whatever powers that be you're going to meet after you're not in this veil of tears anymore. Anyway, so um, that's where I'm going to wrap this up, right? With the information, knowledge, wisdom, mastery, whatever you want to call it, right? Remember that paradigm, okay? And these are all things that were given to me in the context of, of the martial arts training because, again... I, I consider myself to be very, very lucky um, that my teachers taught from that perspective. Okay, But at the same time, I had to make a decision and act on those decisions because I've always decided that I was going to work with the best that I could find and whatever they told me to do, right? Unless I saw too many signs of bullshit, right? Because you always have to have a healthy level of doubt, Okay. Not where you're questioning everything at every freaking moment because that's nothing's going to get done, right? But, you know, when you're learning something, does the technique work? Okay. Yeah, I don't know when I would use this one. Well, it doesn't matter because you can't do it yet. Okay. You, one step at a time, right? It's like eating an elephant. One bite at a time, just like everything else. Okay? Um, <clears throat> but you get the learning knowing wisdom but you also have a training format and again there's a forgiveness scale to that right training format and there's a self-defense format right is this good enough to um that I, that I could trust it right in you know in a in a bad situation in an assault situation um I may make a mistake. I may pick the wrong one, right? And then, like, I do that uke nagash, and I run into the solid arm. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, you know what? I won't be doing that again because that uke nagash doesn't work against this guy, this fighter type, right? Well, that's the only one I know because it was my favorite, so that's what I focused on. Oops. Uh, we have nine schools, which means nine different ways to do uke nagash nine different ways to handle a knife attack nine di right so anyway um i'm going to adjust on the fly right so it's a little bit more forgiving but i'm going to adjust on the fly okay um but if this guy's got a knife if this guy's got a gun if this guy's got three friends um whatever 
Okay. The, the consequences of failure goes up. Okay. The dojo is heavily laden with failure. It's where you're supposed to make mistakes. Okay. You make mistakes in a dojo and you get punished for them one way or the other. Right. The minimum is your teacher saying no. Okay. He hurt my feelings when he told me it did my stuff sucked. Well, better him telling you that your stuff sucked than you finding out because you had a false sense of confidence and some jack wagon murdered you on the street because you pulled the wrong technique. Well, it's my favorite. Well, it sucks. Your favorite got you killed. Okay. So um, we make the mistakes there. So we're going to make less out on the street. Okay. But we have to understand that there's more than just the moves. If we don't know, out of all the stuff that we've learned, in a particular situation, I don't give a rat's ass, flying shit, whatever, how close that situation looks to other ones I've been in, it's not the same. Similar is not the same. This is not the same person with the same brain in the same moment, probably with the same reason for attacking me that the other guy had. Okay. Last time I was attacked, I was wearing a uniform. Okay. Oh, I take that back. I was out of uniform. No, no, that was a, that was the bridge. Anyway, probably in uniform. Anyway, so um, the uh, the consequences go up, right? We make the mistakes, and we go through the the, the training. So we, <laughs> right? But at the end of it all, at the end of it all, the decision comes down to those of you on audio only can't see the mudra I made way back at the beginning, right? This outer bonds, this this musubi, this this binding knot kind of thing, right? This mudra that's in the base levels of the Gyoko school recognizing that universal justice says whoever does the most things right, least things wrong, at the right and wrong, whatever, right? It's going to win. Ego aside, beliefs aside, righteousness aside, I'm on God's side. Mox Nix, as my German friends would say, matters not, doesn't matter, Okay. Because ultimately, that's who's going to win. But it's one thing to say it. It's like, Gokuro Samadeshita. Right? I heard it in the Kuden. Sensei said it. Yeah, this is not about hearing it. This is not about believing it. First class in the first seven steps on the Path of a Buddha course and I think in the, in the no, I don't think it was in the Sanji Shichu Bon program, but th they can correct me if I'm wrong. But very first class in the first seven steps program was the instruction that you're not allowed to say that you believe any of this stuff. Because it's not a, this is not an act of blind faith. This is observation. This is understanding. This is a scientific process. One of the, <laughs> we'll wrap this up with this. One of the most surprising things that my first teacher in this art hit me with was before we describe ourselves as martial artists, see, there's another phrase right up there with enlightenment, wisdom, mastery, warrior, whatever, right? Martial artist. Okay. To get to the artist part, right? Think about an artist, right? They throw paint or whatever around, move a brush around or whatever, and ta-da! You try to do the same thing, and it looks like a six-year-old just brought something home from kindergarten class, right? Um, I did the same thing you did. Yeah, no. Okay? Um, it almost looks like he breaks the rules and produce something better. Yeah, okay? So before we call ourselves martial artists, perhaps, again, you're all adults. You can do whatever you want. 
but before I called myself a martial artist because I took my teachers at face value, right? I called myself a martial scientist because we are studying conflict, the causes of conflict, and the resolution of conflict. All warriors, okay? at least in all the formal clans, right? They studied Heho, H-E-I hyphen H-O, okay? warfare, right? Str uh, methods of strategy and tactics. Okay? <clears throat> and you study it and you know it so well that you know not only when something's appropriate and when it's not appropriate, but you also know when to break the rules. I started this whole thing off with Taijutsu. And sometimes you don't have time for Taijutsu and sometimes you don't have space for Taijutsu. So you just clock their ass or whatever, okay? You're supposed to be moving legs, then torso, then upper limbs. That's the formula for Taijutsu. But even Hatsumi Sensei's Togaku Ryu Ninpo, right? In that section, that's the ideal. Unless you can't move your legs, then you move your torso first. Okay? So lots of people don't like contradiction. It's not a contradiction. It's still using the same principles and concepts. Okay? But ego doesn't like that kind of stuff because we've been using this to <laughs> and most of these things, right? It's too much damn work. But um, the wages of sin are death. Comes out of the Bible, comes out of Romans, right? Sin means to miss your mark. Okay? Wrong brush, wrong technique, wrong tactic, wrong skill, wrong... Okay? Because everybody's learning all these things, and then right, you'll have to you'll have to decide whether. Hopefully, you're not. I, I'm hoping. I'm hoping that you're not putting too much faith or belief into any of these techniques or skills. With whether I don't care if it's spoken, unspoken. There's just a feel or a deep seated belief or whatever that they're always going to work. They're unbeatable. Don't do that. There's too many fucking charlatans already out on the internet selling you the unbeatable techniques. Okay? Well, we're not going to buy that, right? It's this one technique. You can beat any attacker in 30 minutes. Well, if you don't believe that, then you might want to double check to make sure you don't believe the same thing about your own techniques. Okay? Because in any situation, 95% of what you learned is not going to be applicable. Mastery is knowing which ones are and being able to do it without thinking, without thinking, left brain thinking, right? Um, yeah. To me, mastery is going from this stuff being something you do to becoming so much a part of who you are that you can't not do it. And that's where I'll end this. So, James, questions, comments, dinner? I haven't eaten since 10.30 this morning. It's a long funeral. Whew. Well, and prep and anyway. Questions, comments? Uh, the only comment I saw was Sensei McLaurin said he was trying to write that down until you said that. Trying to write what? Trying to write what down? I assume the uh, the other thank you in Japanese. Oh, Goku no Sama Deshita. G O K U. Goku. No, R O. Sama. S A M A. Deshita. D E S. Literally, or written out, it would be D E S H I T A. 
but the I is clipped, so it's pronounced based. Thank you very much for the unexpected deed. Sure. <laughs> That's the only one I saw. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you, everybody wants black and white on this kind of stuff, right? But um, just like Hi and EA are not literal yes and no. They could be, but Hi and EA are positive and affirmative as to what you just said. So if you pull a, you don't have any bananas, do you? And they don't, they'll say hi. What you just said was correct. But from an English standpoint, what'd you just hear? Yes, we have bananas. So you'll stand there all day long waiting for somebody to lead you off to where the bananas are. But that's not what they said. What they said was, that's correct. Okay. Or if you say you don't have any bananas, do you? And they say, yeah. Right. What'd you just hear? No. Right. But what they said was, no, that's not correct. It's context. Okay. And you can do the same thing with thank you. Those kind of things, right? Like if you if you borrowed money from somebody, right? And uh, you, let's say you repaid them. You borrowed 50 bucks, you gave them 20 bucks back, right? And so you still owe them 30 bucks. Okay. If you're waiting for a thank you from them and not just a, eh, or some acknowledgement that way, you're going to be waiting for a long time because he's not thanking you for giving you something you owed him. doesn't work that way. Okay. So I point this out quite often. I'm going to do it again. If this is difficult for you to understand, because language points to how a culture thinks about life experience and engagement and interaction. If that's difficult to understand, imagine how difficult it really must be to understand a Japanese martial art developed hundreds of years before the modern Japanese, so much so that modern Japanese, outside of your teachers, who hopefully the Japanese teachers get it, right? Um, they don't understand the context. Right? Uh, when I was, uh, we're talking mid to late 80s, one of my friends, John Poliquin, I think he still lives in Portland, Maine. Uh, lost touch with him a bunch of years ago. He had hired a Japanese person, translator, to translate one of Hatsumi Sensei's books um, into English. It was just written in Japanese, into English. I think it was, um, I can't remember if it was Knife and Pistol Fighting. I think it was the Hanbo Jutsu, Jute Jutsu, Tessin Jutsu book. But either way, right? Can you translate this into English for me, right? Um, she could only translate 75% of the book because she had no idea what a lot of the references mean uh, meant because she didn't train in this art. And then he went to Dayton, right, to, to Germantown, because uh, we were both under Stephen Hayes at that point, and uh, Stephen Hayes' wife, Rumiko, Japanese, right? But she also trains in as a student of Hatsumi Sensei. See, the context is different. The understanding, the nuances, right? Shows her the book. Okay? This one was only able to translate 75% of the book. And half of that was wrong. And here we are, Westerners, guessing our way through. Some of us try to guess way less. because, <laughs> And sometimes I frustrate, frustrate some of you, my guys in the dojo know. I'm sure... Uh, uh, Chris gets frustrated with this because he wants an answer. And I go, I don't know. I wasn't there. But based on what I know and based on the principles and concepts, right? But you know what? I've heard that same statement from Hatsumi Sensei at Hombu Dojo in Japan. Okay. 
I'm teaching based on what I have in the scrolls, based on what I got from my teacher, based on my extensive study and knowledge. But this ultimately comes down to one thing. I wasn't there when this stuff was originally developed. So we go right back to Marshall Scientist. Okay. You become an artist when you know the, the, the stuff so well that you can, it looks like you just create it with, with ease. All right. But again, you can call yourself whatever you want. Okay. There's people calling themselves all kinds of things these days. Do what you want. Okay. All right. Anything else? Uh, comment in from YouTube. Person goes by Into. Okay. Uh, I really like the pointings, and they're from the Netherlands. The Netherlands? The pointings? Yes, sir. I don't understand the context. Is this a is this a story or a reference or a reference to something I said? No, the Netherlands. Okay. Can you copy and paste that and into a, like an email and send that to me so I can look it up? Okay. Okay. I need more context, but I'll do my research. Okay. Uh, for those of you who have been missing me classes and all that. I don't mean like missing me like, oh, we miss them. Um, I mean like I'm in there to teach class. James covered a class for me tonight, all that stuff. Um, like I said, at the beginning, we laid my mother-in-law to rest today, so I should be back on track uh, with everything tomorrow, so um, everything's good. So um, and that's it. That's all we got. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, in that case, uh, hopefully I gave you a few things to think about you know, you can always uh, write me an email. Uh, please keep it to one. I don't need 50 in four and a half minutes. Um, and if it looks like um, uh, reasoning and thought processes or you're another one of the king of the yogi or uh, whatever, um, that conversation will be short lived. Right. So anyway, um, but. I'm, I'm here to help anybody who's sane and rational or as sane as normal right and then uh we'll go from there all right so uh james if you can hold on after i wrap this up then uh we'll have our little chat and but every, every um for everyone else uh wednesday 3 p.m eastern time we got our whiteboard wednesday and uh still got uh, some other openings and, and some programs that are coming up fall camp is coming up um what are we holy crap uh two weeks away no it's the end of this it's not the end of this week it's the end of next week right two weeks 13th, 14th, and 15th, right? And there are virtual spots available, online ninjaacademy.com forward slash events. And uh, that's where you also find a link. If you can't make it live or virtual, uh, you can just pre-order the, uh, uh, the recordings, okay? Which um, I need to head this off. Will not be available till after camp is over. Why am I saying this? For the same reason that lawn mowers are sold with instructions to not put your goddamn hands and feet under the mower while it's running or to not use a hair dryer while you're sleeping or because people have done it, right? So why do I say it? Because we've had people pre-order, pre-order the recordings and then wonder why they didn't get the download page and it's three days before camp is even supposed to start we're good not that good <laughs> if we were that good shit <laughs> uh anyway all right so that's it i'll talk to everybody again next time on kuden get more of kuden radio subscribe through your favorite podcasting site or join our clan of serious modern warriors at online ninja academy.com <laughs>